Welcome back to uh, this uh, next section in Biblical Directionism Counseling. We're going now to look at some case studies. This is Dennis Fry, your professor for the course. So I'd like for us to turn now to some case studies that uh, will take step number one, determinative profiling, and go all the way through personal conditioning and look at the uh, individual case studies. So what are our uh, five steps? The five steps are determinative profiling, step number two, comparative silhouetting, step number three, redemptive confrontation, step number four, individual commitment, and step number five, personal conditioning. Turning now to the first step, uh, if profiling is a generic initial step in proper biblical counseling, then the scriptures themselves ought to provide clear evidence of it. And so the following selections are only representative of a vast quantity of such evidence. Uh, they provide concise examples, but let me be clear, in all five steps, the scriptures are filled. It's just ubiquitous. And as we learn from the textbook, these five steps are actually the way God deals with human beings. How does God deal with human beings? He does it in five generic steps. First of all, he never, he never takes us for someone else. We always stand individually before God. He never compares us against any standard except his own standard. His desire is to show us, to confront us, to show us where we stand in relation to him, always for the purpose of redemption. Then he wants to provide for us a way that we can grow in grace, we can turn to him, we can grow in grace. And then he wants us to continue to do that until he calls us home to heaven. So, biblical case studies, God counsels Adam and the woman. Genesis 3, 8 through 13. Then the man and his wife heard the sound of the Lord God as he was walking in the garden in the cool of the day, and they hid from the Lord God among the trees of the garden. But the Lord called to the man, Where are you? Where are you? He answered, I heard you in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked, so I hid. And he said, who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten from the tree that I commanded you not to eat from? The man said, The woman you put here with me, she gave me some fruit from the tree and I ate it. Then the Lord said to the woman, What is this you have done? Now data gathering begins in verse 1 when God asks the first of several questions. Now in this case, Profiling transcends mere data gathering and is actually instructive since it's obvious that the questions were not asked for God's benefit. Even in the case of human counselors, profiling can and often is an instructive tool as well as a data gathering process. Now let's look at Joseph counseling Pharaoh's cupbearer from Genesis 40, verses 6 through 9. When Joseph gave to them I'm sorry, when Joseph came to them the next morning, he saw that they were dejected. So he asked Pharaoh's officials who were in custody with him in his master's house. Why are your faces so sad today? We both had dreams, they answered. But there was no one to interpret them. Then Joseph said to them, Do not interpretations belong to God? Tell me your dreams. So the chief cupbearer told Joseph his dreams. Now Joseph begins his counseling process by asking the question, why are your faces so sad today? And before attempting to actually give counsel, he asks for further details. Tell me your dreams. Not until Joseph was in possession of all the facts did he proceed to give counsel. How about Daniel counseling Nebuchadnezzar? 
from Daniel 4, 8 through 10. Finally, Daniel came into my presence, and I told him the dream. I said, I know that the spirit of the holy gods is in you, and that no mystery is too difficult for you. Here is my dream. Interpret it for me. These are the visions I saw while lying on, lying on my bed. Daniel's asked to interpret the king's dream, but notice the initial process of profiling. I told him the dream. Here is my dream. These are the visions I saw. Now about Jesus, counseling the rich young man, from Matthew 19, 16 through 20. Now a man came to Jesus and asked, Teacher, what good thing must I do to get eternal life? Why do you ask me what is good? There is only one who is good. If you want to enter eternal life, obey the commandments. Which one? The man answered. Jesus replied, Do not murder, do not commit adultery, do not steal, do not give false testimony. Honor your father and mother. Love your neighbors yourself. All these I have kept, the young man said. What do I still lack? So this young man came to Jesus for counsel. Notice Jesus' initial question. Why do you ask me about what is good? Prior to giving actual counsel, Jesus leads the rich young man into further data gathering by exciting him to discuss his past. In so doing, the young man reveals a great deal about himself. In our premier case study, Nathan counseling David. The Lord sent Nathan to David. And when he came to him, he said, this is 2 Samuel 12, of course. In this case, Nathan had directly been through the process of profiling already before approaching David. Notice what he says. The Lord sent David to Nathan. God would not have permitted Nathan to approach David without knowing all the facts of the case. A further reading of the narrative reveals that Nathan was in possession of the entire background and facts surrounding this case. While present-day counselors would be foolish to presume that God would give this kind of inside information he granted to Nathan, it is nonetheless true that the genuine biblical counselor may expect that God's Holy Spirit will be directly involved in the data gathering process, enabling the counselor to better profile the one who God has sent his or her way. And by the way, biblical counseling is different from all other forms of counseling in this way. There are never less than three persons involved in biblical counseling. If it's truly biblical counseling, and if a counselor is truly a biblical counselor, in other words, a, a, a born-again man or woman of God who is following God's lead and God's call, there are never less than three persons, the counselor, the counselee, and the Holy Spirit. Now, so what was the result of those uh, case studies? Well, uh, the results in God counseling Adam and the woman, the, the result of profiling here is that God draws up a profile of Adam and the woman, which instantly reveals their condition. Joseph counseling Pharaoh's cupbearer, the result of profiling here is that Joseph is supplied with adequate information by which he is enabled to interpret the dream. In the case of Daniel and Nebuchadnezzar, Daniel is given the facts of the king's dream, and he's able then to proceed with interpretation. Jesus counseling the rich young man results in a profile that reveals the real character of the young man. And in the case of Nathan and Daniel, the results here is that God has enabled Nathan to proceed counseling David without fear of being misdirected. In each case, the result of profiling enabled the counselor and the counselee to proceed with accurate and adequate information related to that specific situation. Also, in each case, successful profiling, profiling led directly to step two, biblical directionism counseling, and that is comparing that person with God's righteous standard, comparative silhouetting. Now, to initiate the giving of counsel without first having examined, tested, and thus arrived at a determinative profile of the counselee is to violate a simple and basic premise of sound Biblical reasoning, Proverbs 14, 15. A simple man believes anything, but a prudent man gives thought to his steps. Proverbs 18, 13. He who answers before listening, that is his folly and his shame. Proverbs 18, 15. The heart of the discerning acquires knowledge, 
but the ears of the wise seek it out. Let us turn then to comparative silhouetting. If it's the generic second step, then the scriptures ought to abound with clear evidence of it. So here are some representative evidences of it. About God counseling Cain, Genesis 4, 4 through 7. But Abel brought fat portions from some of the firstborn of his flock. The Lord looked, and looked, the Lord looked with favor on Abel and his offering, but on Cain and his offering he did not look with favor. So Cain was very angry, and his face was downcast. And the Lord said to Cain, why are you angry? Why is your face downcast? If you do what is right, will you not be accepted? But if you do not do what is right, sin is crouching at your door. It desires to have you, but you must master it. Now God begins the conversation with Cain by profiling. Why are you angry? Why is your face downcast? Next, God compares Cain's silhouette over against his own righteous standard. If you do what is right, will you not be accepted? But if you do not do what is right, sin is crouching at your door. If you do what is right, will you not be accepted? That's God's righteous standard. But if you do not, sin is crouching at the door. That's Cain's present state of being. So a proper comparison has now been drawn between God's silhouette of righteousness and Cain's silhouette, the present state of his being, of his unrighteousness. All right, how about Reuben counseling his brothers? from Genesis 37, 19 through 22. Here comes the dreamer, they said to each other. Come now, let's kill him and throw him into one of the cisterns and say that a ferocious animal devoured him. Then we'll see what comes of his dreams. When Reuben heard this, he tried to rescue him from his hands, from their hands. Let's not take his life, he said. Don't shed innocent blood. Throw him into this cistern here in the desert, but don't lay a hand on him. Now Reuben is actually silhouetting the obnoxious intentions of his brother upon the righteous requirements of God's law. Verse 22, do not shed, don't shed any innocent blood. The silhouette of the brothers is projected upon the standard of God's higher law, which prohibited the shedding of innocent blood. And this very concept was only a few generations later incorporated in the Mosaic law, thou shalt not kill. All right, how about the psalmist's use of silhouetting? Psalm 119, 9 through 11, how can a young man keep his way pure? By living according to your word. I seek you with all my heart. Do not let me stray from your commands. I have hid your word in my heart that I might not sin against you. Here, the young man is kept pure by a continual process of projecting the circumscribed whole of his life over against the silhouette of God's righteous standard. When the two match up, the young man's way is pure. All right, how about Peter counseling the Simon, who was the sorcerer? Acts 8, 18 through 21. When Simon saw that the Spirit was given at the laying on of the apostles' hands, he offered them money and said, Give me also this ability, so that everyone on whom I lay hands may receive the Holy Spirit. Peter answered him, May your money perish with you, because you thought you could buy the gift of God with money. You have no part or share in this ministry because your heart's not right before God. So Peter quite openly and publicly silhouettes Simon's wrong attitude toward the giving of the gift of the Holy Spirit with that of God's standard. Quote, you thought you could buy the gift of God with money. Your heart is not right before God. All right, how about our case study, our premier case study here. Nathan counsels Daniel. <laughs> David, I'm sorry. So 2 Samuel 12, 1 through 6. The Lord sent Nathan to David when he came and he said, there are two men in a certain town, one rich and the other poor. The rich man had a very large number of sheep and cattle, but the poor man had nothing except one little ewe lamb he had bought. He raised it and it grew up with him and his children. He shared his food and drank from his cup and even slept in his arms. It was like a daughter to him. Now a traveler came to the rich man, but the rich man refrained from taking one of his own sheep or cattle to prepare a meal for the traveler who had come to him. Instead, he took the ewe lamb that belonged to the poor man and prepared it for the one who had come to him. David burned with anger against the man and said to Nathan, As surely as the Lord lives, 
the man who did this deserves to die. He must pay for that lamb four times over because he did such a thing and had no pity. Now, in an allegorical manner, Nathan contrasts the actions of the supposed rich neighbor, actually David himself, over against the righteous standard of God's law. All right, what were the, what were the results? Well, for Cain counseling, God counseling Cain, Cain's receiving counsel from God, the results of a comparative silhouetting here is that Cain's immediate condition is contrasted in such a way as to reveal the reason for his anger and his downcast face. Reuben counseling his brothers. The result of comparative silhouetting here is that the proposed action of Reuben's brothers is revealed to be incongruent with God's righteous standard. The psalmist's use of profiling. The result of comparative silhouetting here is that the young man is permitted to know the actual standard by which he ought to live. Present actions or attitudes are kept in constant balance with God's word by reason of routine analysis, comparing this and silhouetting. Peter counsels Simon the sorcerer. The result of comparative silhouetting here is that Peter is able to reveal the real motive of Simon by reason of an accurate comparison of God's standard for receiving the gift of the Holy Spirit and Simon's own evil intentions. Now, how about our premier case study with Nathan, who counsels David? Well, the results of comparative silhouetting here are sharply defined. David is so incensed at the wickedness of the rich neighbor, he, quote, burned with anger and said, quote, as surely as the Lord lives, the man who did this deserves to die. He must pay for that lamb four times over because he did such a thing and had no pity. David is reflecting back on the Mosaic law of restitution for sheep stealing, which required that four sheep be paid back for every one sheep stolen. That's from Exodus 22.1 and determines the rich neighbor's actions to be unacceptable and wholly evil. Hmm. In each case, the result of silhouetting enabled the counselor, and in some cases the counselee, to establish a standard for right and wrong conduct based upon the comparative analysis of the silhouette of man's present state of being projected upon the silhouette of God's absolute standard. Now, to attempt to judge actions as right or wrong without some system of infallible absolutes is to violate a simple and basic premise of sound reason. If no infallible standard exists, then comparative silhouetting is only an exercise in futility, and no valid analysis of action or attitude is possible. But Proverbs 6.23 says, For these commands are a lamp, this teaching is a light, and the corrections of discipline are the way of life. Romans 7.12, so then the law is holy, and the commandment is holy, righteous, and good. Now, if confrontation then, which is the third step, is the generic third step, the scriptures ought to abound with clear evidence of it. So again, here are some examples. How about the angel counseling Balaam from Numbers Chapter 22, verse 32 and 33. The angel of the Lord asked him, Why have you beaten your donkey these three times? I have come here to oppose you because your path is a reckless one before me. The donkey saw me and turned away from me these three times. If she had not turned away, I would certainly have killed you by now, but I would have spared her. This case is very clear. Balaam's donkey prevented Balaam's death, and the angel of the Lord confronted Balaam with the facts of his near death and the reason why. Joshua counsels the nation of Israel from Joshua 24, verses 19 through 24. Joshua said to the people, You are not able to serve the Lord. He is a holy God. He is a jealous God. He will not forgive your rebellion and your sins. If you forsake the Lord and serve foreign gods, he will turn and bring disaster on you and make an end of you after he has been good to you. But the people said to Joshua, No, we will serve the Lord. Now, after properly profiling and silhouetting the condition of the nation of Israel, Joshua confronts them with the facts of their present state of being. All right, how about Deborah uh, counseling Barak 
Barak said to her, If you go with me, I will go. But if you do not go with me, I won't go. Very well, Deborah said, I will go with you. But because of the way you are going about this, the honor will not be yours, for the Lord will hand Sisera over to a woman. So Deborah went with Barak to Kedish, Judges 4, 8, and 9. Having explained to Barak God's plan for the deliverance of Israel out of the hands of Jabin, the Canaanite king, Deborah is, Deborah is faced with Barak's hesitation. And so she confronts him with the consequences of his decision. Here's a pretty harsh one. Peter counsels Ananias and Sapphira from Acts 5, 3 through 5. Then Peter said, Ananias, how is it that Satan has so filled your heart that you have lied to the Holy Spirit and have kept for yourself some of the money you received for the land? Didn't it belong to you before it was sold? And after it was sold, wasn't the money at your disposal? What made you think of doing such a thing? You have not lied to men, but to God. When Ananias heard this, he fell down and died. And the great fear seized all those who heard what had happened. Now, in this terrifying account of rebellion against God's righteous standard, Peter confronts Ananias and his wife, Sapphira, later. And the consequences of his violation are hard. The wages of sin is death. Now, in our premier case study, then Nathan said to David, here's confrontation for sure, then Nathan said to David, you are the man. Nathan had received an exact profile of David from God. He skillfully silhouetted David's past actions by the use of a parable. Now he confronts David with the reality of his situation. So what were the results? Well, in the angel counseling Balaam, the results of confrontation is that Balaam is brought face to face with how close he had come to death and why he had been spared. Joshua counseling the nation of Israel results in the confrontation that Israel is faced with the reality of their condition, being made aware that a choice must be made and what they may expect as a result of such a choice. With Deborah and Barak, the results of confrontation is that Barak is brought face to face with the consequences of his fearful hesitation and lack of faith in God's plan. With Peter counseling Ananias and Sapphira, the results of confrontation is graphic and terrifying. Now, in the case of Nathan counseling David, the result of confrontation here is to bring David face to face with the fact that neither God nor man had whitewashed the king's awful atrocity against Uriah, and that in this case, there would be a serious price to pay along with the need for a decision of profound importance. In each case, the results of confrontation involve the explanation of how the counselee's present state of being was a result of a failure to have lived in accordance with the standard of God's word. It also involved pointing out what was to be expected as a result of the present condition. Now, to attempt to assist an individual through counseling without coming at the proper point in time to a place of confrontation is to violate a simple and basic premise of sound reason. If confrontation is given no place in the counseling process, how is one to determine the nature of past actions, their possible consequences, and the possibility of corrective action. So Job 31, 14. What will I do when God confronts me? <clears throat> what will I answer when called to account? Psalm 139, verses 23 and 24. Search me, O God, and know my heart. Test me and know my anxious thought. See if there be any offensive way in me, and lead me in the way everlasting. <clears throat> Proverbs 15.5, a fool spurns his father's discipline, but whoever heeds correction shows prudence. And then finally, 1 Samuel 12.6-7, then Samuel said to the people, It is the Lord who appointed Moses and Aaron and brought your forefathers up out of Egypt. Now then stand here, because I am going to confront you with evidence before the Lord as to all the righteous acts performed by the Lord for you and your fathers. And then finally, we go to individual commitment. And again, the scriptures abound 
with the evidence of it. So let's look at God counseling Noah. So God said to Noah, this is Genesis chapter 6, verses 13, 15, and uh, verse 22. So God said to Noah, I'm going to put an end to all the people, for the earth is filled with violence because of them. I'm surely going to destroy both them and the earth. So make yourself an ark of cypress wood. Make rooms in it and coat it with pitch inside and out. This is how you are to build it. Noah did everything just as God commanded him. That commitment was required is clear in these words. So make yourself an ark. This is how you are to build it. Jethro counseling Moses from Exodus chapter 18. Moses' father-in-law replied, What you are doing is not good. You and these people who came to you will only wear yourselves out. This work is too heavy for you. You cannot handle it, handle it alone. Listen now to me, and I will give you some advice, and may God be with you. Moses listened to his father-in-law and did everything he said. So the commitment was required is made clear in these words. Listen to me, and I will give you some advice. How about Eli counseling Samuel <clears throat> from 1 Samuel chapter 3, verses 9 and 10? So Eli told Samuel, go and lie down, and if he calls you, say, speak, Lord, for your servant is listening. So Samuel went and lay down in his place. The Lord came and stood there, calling as at the other times, Samuel, Samuel. Then Samuel said, speak, for your servant is listening. Now that commitment was required here is made clear in these words. Go and lie down, and if he calls to you, say, Speak, Lord, your servant is listening. How about Jesus counseling Simon from Luke chapter 5, verses 4 through 6? When he had finished speaking, he said to Simon, put out, your, put out into deep water and let down your nets for a catch. And Simon answered, Master, we've worked hard all night, haven't caught anything, but because you say so, I will let down the nets. When they had done so, they caught such a large number of fish that their nets began to break. Now, that commitment is required is clear from the arguments Simon puts up about having worked all night and caught nothing. And still, Jesus requires commitment. Put out into deep water and let down the nets for a catch. And then we look at our case study with Nathan counseling David. You did in secret. You did it in secret. Second Samuel chapter 12. You did it in secret. But I will do this thing in broad daylight before all Israel. And David said to Nathan, I have sinned against the Lord. Nathan replied, The Lord has taken away your sin. You're not going to die. Now that commitment was required here is made clear in David's reaction to Nathan's confrontation. He says, I have sinned against the Lord. The primary and initial step of commitment is repentance. This David knew full well and willingly took this step as evidence of his deliberate decision to take whatever action was necessary to correct his way. So the results. <clears throat> God counseling Noah. The results of a call to commitment here is revealed in the words, Noah did everything just as God commanded him. And Jethro and Moses, the result of the call to commitment is revealed in these words, quote, Moses listened to his father-in-law and did everything he said. How about Eli, Eli counseling Samuel? Then, then, so Samuel went and lay down in his place. Then Samuel said, Speak, for your servant is listening. And in the premier case study, David is willing <clears throat> to commit and is revealed in these words, I have sinned against the Lord. I have sinned against the Lord. In each of the case studies above, the counselee was faithful to the call to commitment. Now, in all such cases, tragedy resulted when there was a failure to commit. When there was a failure to commit. Examples would be Cain's rejection of God. The nation's rejection of Moses' call to enter the promised land. They had to stay 40 years rather than 40 days. Jonah's initial reaction, rejection of God's call, he winds up in the belly of the sea monster. The rich young man's rejection of Jesus' call, 
to self-abnegation results in his being lost, goes away with a broken heart, downcast. The contrast in the case studies of those willing to and those who refuse to is stark. To confront a counselee with the realities of his or her present state of being without also calling that person to commitment is to really to violate a simple and basic premise of sound reasoning. Psalm 32.10 Many are the woes of the wicked, but the Lord's unfailing love surrounds the man who trusts in him. Psalm 34.22 The Lord redeems his servants. No one who takes refuge in him will be condemned. Proverbs 29.25 Fear of man will prove a snare, but whoever trusts in the Lord will be kept safe. And then Hebrews 4.11 let us therefore make every effort to enter that rest so that no one will fall by following their example of disobedience. And then finally we turn, now this is step four, we turn to the final case study which is personal conditioning. Individual commitment, personal conditioning now the final step. How about the two angels that counsel Lot and his family? Genesis 19 verses 15 through 17 and verse 26. With the coming of dawn, the angels urged Lot, saying, Hurry, take your wife and your two daughters who are here, or you will be swept away with when the city is punished. And when he hesitated, the men grasped his hand and the hands of his wife and of his two daughters and led them safely out of the city, for the Lord was merciful to them. As soon as they had brought them out, one of them said, flee for your lives. Don't look back and don't stop anywhere in the plain. Flee to the mountains or you will be swept away. But Lot's wife looked back and she became a pillar of salt. Here, personal conditioning is in the form of a specific command. Flee for your lives. Don't look back and don't stop anywhere in the plain. Now we have Naomi who counsels Ruth from Ruth chapter 3 and chapter 4. One day, no, pardon me, one day Naomi, her mother-in-law, said to her, My daughter, should I not try to find a home for you where you will be provided for? Is not Boaz, with whose servant girls you have been, a kinsman of ours? Tonight, he will be winnowing barley on the threshing floor. Wash and perfume, perfume yourself and put on your best clothes and then go to the threshing floor and don't let him know that you are there until he has finished eating and drinking. When he lies down, note the place where he is lying and then go over and uncover his feet and lie down. He will tell you what to do. I will do whatever you say, Ruth answered. So she went down to the threshing floor and did everything her mother-in-law told her to do. So Boaz took Ruth, and she became his wife, and the Lord enabled her to conceive, and she gave birth to a son. Now in this case, personal conditioning is in the form of a difficult and unusual recommendation. What Naomi asked of her daughter-in-law is so strange that only Ruth's commitment to doing what was right, to personal conditioning, could have possibly sustained her through the, actually putting it into action. How about Elijah who counseled Nahum? Uh, you remember this account from 2 Kings uh, chapter 5. Elisha sent his messenger to him, Go wash yourself seven times in the Jordan, and your flesh will be restored to you, and you will be cleansed. And Naaman went away angry and said, I thought that he would surely come out to me and stand and call on the name of the Lord his God and wave his hand over the spot and cure me of leprosy. Are not Abana and far, far the rivers of Damascus better than any of the waters of Israel? Couldn't I wash in them and be clean? So he turned and went off in a rage. Naaman's servant went to him and said, My father, if the prophet had told you to do something great, would you not have done it? How much more then when he tells you to wash and be cleansed? So he went down and dipped himself in the Jordan seven times as the man of God told him, and his flesh was restored and became clean like that of a young boy. Now the tremendous element of humility involved here initially became a barrier to Naaman's healing. 
Personal conditioning often requires the breaking of the pride barrier. In this case, personal conditioning was essential, and that only by following Elijah, Elisha's specific command, go wash seven times in the Jordan, could he be healed. Not just once, not twice, but seven times. <clears throat> and then we have God who counsels Ananias concerning Saul. So the Lord said to Ananias, Go, this man is my chosen servant, or my chosen instrument, to carry my name before the Gentiles and their kings and before the people of Israel. I will show him how much he must suffer for my name. Then Ananias went to the house and entered, and Paul, placing his hands on Saul, he said, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus, who appeared to you on the road as you were coming here, has sent me so that you may see again and be filled with the Holy Spirit. Immediately, something like scales fell from Saul's eyes, and he could see again. He got up, was baptized, and after taking some food, he regained his strength. Now, God called to Ananias. His call for personal conditioning was no easy thing. The reputation of Saul was such that Ananias had good reason to fear for his life. The biblical call to personal conditioning is often risky. I mean, by man's standards. And the only genuinely, only the genuinely committed will actually take the step of adaptation, modification, and molding, which is personal conditioning. Now, how about in our <clears throat> premier case study? Well, uh, as a result of uh, the confrontation and David's commitment, we know from Second Samuel chapter 12 and Second Samuel chapter 9 and uh, 19, rather, that David does the right thing and, uh, and follows through with it and is faithful to uh, do so for the rest of his life. What about the results? And let's look at the results of the two angels counseling Lot and his family. The results of personal conditioning here are mixed. Lot and his two daughters are obedient, but Lot's wife failed to adapt. And as a result, Lot and his daughters are saved, but his wife is lost. It's always that way, the results of obedience or disobedience. Those who adapt, modify, and mold their lives to the personal conditioning call of God will experience reward. Those who refuse, no matter how well-intentioned, will experience loss. What about Naomi, who counseled Ruth? The result of personal conditioning here is obvious, so Ruth took so, I'm sorry, so Boaz took Ruth, and she became his wife. And the Lord enabled her to conceive, and she gave birth to a son. Elisha, counseling Nahum. The result of obedience to personal conditioning are clearly expressed in verse 15 of that account in Second Kings. His flesh was restored and became like that of a young man. And then counseling uh, of God's counseling uh, Ananias concerning Saul. The result of personal conditioning here is actually twofold. Both Ananias and Saul receive the benefits of obedience to God's command. It is most often the case that when any individual remains faithful to the personal conditioning required as a consequence of his or her commitment to God, others will surely benefit also. And then finally, <clears throat> our premier case study. Let's take a look at it in the five steps. Step number one, determinative, determinative profiling. God reveals to Nathan all the facts concerning David's sin with Bathsheba. Consequently, Nathan is able to proceed with his counseling without fear of misdiagnosis or misdirection. Step number two, comparative silhouetting. Nathan takes the determinative profile data provided by God and projects it, compares that data over against the righteous standard of God's law. David becomes so incensed at the injustice of the case that he sees clearly the incongruence between the act committed and the standard violated. Step number three, redemptive confrontation. Following the clearly defined comparative silhouetting and David's declaration that the man was deserving of punishment, Nathan brings David face to face with the reality of his own sinful condition. Step number four, individual commitment. Now look, David was king. He was all-powerful in matters of government and law. 
he might easily have sentenced Nathan to prison or condemned him to be executed. Nathan's confrontation of David required an individual commitment from the king, and David must either commit to God's call and repent or commit to rejecting God's call and order Nathan's punishment or perhaps execution. And that David committed to God's call for repentance is confirmed in his own words, quote, I have sinned against the Lord. And then step number five of personal conditioning. And this final step, the call to personal conditioning, is expressed in Nathan's warning. The son born to you will die. Even after his powerful expression of individual commitment, David might easily have refused to enter this final phase. Now, wait a minute. I'm sorry, but I don't want the child to die. However, his willingness to adapt, modify, and mold is implicit in his attitude and actions immediately following Nathan's warning that the son born to Bathsheba would die. This same willingness is explicit in verse 20. Quote, then David got up from the ground after he had washed, put on lotions, and changed his clothes. He went into the house of the Lord and worshipped. The final result of David's willingness to enter conditioning is revealed in verse 24. Then David comforted his wife Bathsheba, and he went to her and lay with her, and she gave birth to a son, and they named him Solomon. The Lord loved him. <clears throat> so we have seen in these uh, five steps, we have seen then biblical case studies. We've seen a foundational premise work through a derivative system, and then finally into five sequential steps.